The CO2 cycle is an amazing and integral part of how all living things on our Earth survive. All humans and animals breathe out CO2 upon oxygen conversion in our bodies. All carbon-based fossil fuels also release CO2 when burned through the process of combustion. The elegance of the system is, of course, that all plant life takes in the sun's energy and through the photosynthesis process absorbs CO2 and gives off oxygen. Fortunately for us, oxygen is what we need and CO2 is what the plants need. The more CO2 plants get, the faster and better they grow. At times in Earth's history, CO2 levels were much higher than they are today, and plant life thrived at amazing rates. Carbon dioxide is a natural occurring molecule and a building block for all life on Earth. CO2 is an essential food source for the estimated three trillion trees and other plant life on our planet. Our climate has always changed and always will change. The Milankovitch cycle, named after the Serbian astronomer and mathematician who is generally credited with calculating the magnitude of the changes in the Earth's eccentricity, axial tilt, and precession. Taken in unison, variations in these three cycles create alterations in the seasonality of solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface. These times of increased or decreased radiation directly influence the Earth's climate system, thus impacting the advance and retreat of Earth's glaciers and guaranteeing that climate does change on Earth. When reviewing temperature variations on Earth over 65 million plus years, you find that average global temperatures have varied from over 16 degrees Celsius higher when compared to today, to a few degrees colder, and that we have been in a major cooling period. Ice ages are also an inevitable part of life on Earth due to the orbital fluctuations of Earth around the Sun, from a circular orbit to that of an ellipse, on a cycle of about 100,000 years. So over the last 650,000 years, a period of extensive study for the presence of atmospheric CO2, we have experienced multiple regular periods of major glaciation and seven ice ages. Within the last 20,000 years, since the peak of the last major glaciation, 95% of Canada was covered in ice, over three kilometers thick in many places. Due to changes in the Earth's tilt from about 21.5 degrees to about 24.5 degrees over a cycle of every 41,000 years, it is likely we warm and cool, creating better situations for ice growth and retraction, depending upon where we are in the cycle. Currently, we are at about the midpoint. Seasonal changes also occur due to precession, which is the Earth's slow wobble changes as it spins, kind of like a top when it slows. Within the next 10,500 years, summer will occur in the Northern Hemisphere in December and winter in July. And only 5,000 short years ago, the Sahara Desert was green. The problem is we don't live lives of thousands of years to experience the wide natural variations in climate nor do we really consider that more CO2 will promote plant growth and delay what will certainly be the coming of another ice age. We typically relate to our own real-time average life expectancy of 80 to 100 years. What is also well known and documented about the more recent time frame of about 650,000 years is atmospheric CO2 has generally ranged from a low of about 180 parts per million to a high of about 300 parts per million. So generally, climate scientists agree that as we now move past 400 ppm, atmospheric CO2, having accumulated 100 ppm over the last 120 years or so, we are in new modern day uncharted waters. The delicate balance of CO2 to support life on Earth has been upset by something. That something seems to be human activity. The human activity that generates CO2 is the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. The further complication, however, is how small a part we actually play in the CO2 cycle. Human activity produces about 29 billion tons of CO2, which is tiny when compared to the more than approximately 850 billion tons in the atmosphere 
and the 38,000 billion tons of dissolved CO2 in the oceans. Humans are generating CO2 through fossil fuel combustion, while trees and vegetation are absorbing CO2, and oceans are exchanging CO2 with the atmosphere, more as they warm. As tiny a part as we may play, it still may be enough to change nature's balance of the cycle though. Now, clearly the plants will be okay. They have seen CO2 levels 17 times that of today's. The ocean should also be okay with their 45 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere. Earth, which has an astounding 100 million billion tons or one quadrillion tons of carbon permanently sequestered and stored in carbonaceous rocks will also live on. The challenge is how adaptable to the possible, yet to be understood changes that occur, will humans be?